Thank you, Marlene. Good evening, everybody. So good to see you tonight. We're glad you're here. Uh, I want to welcome all of you that are joining us online. We know some of you, and uh, some of you we don't, but it's a joy to know that you've gathered with us, and for all of you here, we're glad that you've gathered tonight. Uh, for those who are online, we just want to make you aware that we do have our morning service at 1030, and we'd be more than happy to have you come and join with us. We have our life groups at, at 9, and so if you don't have a church home, please come and make TFB your church home. 9 o'clock for life groups, 1030 for morning service, 5 o'clock for our Sunday evening worship and witness service, and we'd be happy to have you. Tonight, we, uh, we're going to be worshiping the Lord once again with great joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have so much to be thankful for. So let's start with a word of prayer, and then uh, Pastor Jared will read to us from God's word, and then Neville will lead us in our singing. Heavenly Father, what a joy it is for us to be here. We do have so much for which to be thankful. And Lord, we give you praise we know that without you, we have absolutely nothing. But with you, Heavenly Father, with you, with your Son, Jesus Christ, we have absolutely everything, and we rejoice in this. We pray for those who are not able to be with us tonight. Some are traveling, some are not well. We pray for journey mercies for those who travel and for those who are not well. We, we humbly ask your healing touch for them. And Lord, for some who are just experiencing difficult times right now, we pray for them. We pray that they would sense you reaching out to them and that they would come back to you. We pray for all those, our family that have joined us online. We pray that tonight will be a time of joy and celebration for them as we worship you together. Lead us now, Father God, we pray. We ask these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen, amen. Pastor Jerry. Amen. Let's also remember our youth, as tonight they're going to Sky Zone, and we've invited all of the students at Torrance High School and all of the students at J-Hold Junior High. Now, I don't think everyone's going to show, um, but it was a great time. We passed out tons of pizza over this week, and... So pray for Jeremy and the leaders as they, they lead that, and hopefully we'll get some new students tonight for this outreach event for the youth. And then men, we're going to man camp this coming weekend, so we've got one spot left. If anybody wants it, come talk to me, and we'll make it happen. We're going to have a great time at Thousand Pines. But anyways, I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 16, uh, 13 through 16, sorry, for us tonight, if you'll join me there. It says, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in, in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And so let's have that witness on our tongues at all times. And let's do it now with song. Come join us, Neville. Who is on the Lord's side? We are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are thine. 674, 674. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be his helpers all the life to bring? Who will leave the world side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? By thy call of mercy, by thy 
grace divine. We are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. Verse 4. Fierce may be the conflict, strong may be the foe, but the king's own army none can overthrow. Round his standard raging, victory is secure, for his truth unchanging makes the triumph fall. Joyfully enlisting by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side, Savior, we are thine. Yes, amen. Now it's time for you to greet one another. So please do. We'll continue with uh, 345. 345. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. That's not the right one. What a wonderful Savior. 345. Christ has for sin atonement made. What a wonderful Savior. We are redeemed. The price is paid. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Verse 4. He gives me overwhelming power. What a wonderful Savior. And triumph in each trying hour. What a wonderful Savior. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Amen. All right, for our next one, it's 311. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Three one. 3.11 Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim hallelujah what a savior bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood seal my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a Savior. Verse, verse 4. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Sing the last verse as well. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring, 
Then I knew this song will sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen. Good evening, everyone. We're on the last week of our calendar, so uh, in the back is a new month. So if you don't mind, pick one up. Um, well, the last month on the calendar is always reserved to pray for the hope for the Middle East. And that campaign began, if you remember, in 2010, I believe, the uh, Arab Spring, which brought a revolt against the government in uh, the North Africa and the Middle East. Now, as a result of uh, this uprising, started the Syrian civil war, lasted for 10 years. And then you have the Iraq, and, and um, now we're looking at the, another revolt that is in Iran, you may have heard. As a result of uh, a woman, a young woman of 22, die in custody of the Moro police, uh, there has been a worldwide protest against the hijab, you know, the head covering. Uh, she was believed to not wear it correctly. She had one on, but not wear it correctly, and she died. So the world is on an uprise against um, the hijab, and the Iranian women have been burning their hijab, cutting their hair as a demonstration. Uh, we wanted to take this opportunity to pray uh, not, not for this revolt, but pray for the work of Christ. And last week, um, uh, Pastor Raj, Dad, shared with us uh, the words from John 6, and I'm going to go ahead and read it. It's, uh, it's a few verses. John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me will never be cast out. For I have come to do come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him should have eternal life and will raise up and, and I will raise him up on the last day. So let's pray for the Middle East. Abba, Father, we thank you for the word declared to us that you so love this world, that you give your one and only son. And as we just sang that it is finished, hallelujah, the Lord will raise us up. And Father, as we look at the devastation that is continuing in Syria, in Iraq, and we know in Afghanistan, women and children are in harm's way. And, and Father, in Iran, as, as the oppressions of that uh, regime is continued to um, <clears throat> oppress the rights of the people. So we are asking for the work of your Holy Spirit to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ to them, the one and only who can set us free, free from all things, from sin, from oppressions, from fear, and healing that comes. Father, we pray particularly for the young woman's family. We know, Lord, that uh, opposing governments and the things of this world will not bring eternal life. And so I ask, as they sorrow in this time of loss, as they are anger in this time of grieving, would you open their hearts to hear the gospel? Would you send ambassador of Jesus Christ, Father, to those who are opposing this regime, that they hear the true freedom that Christ grant to them? And we do ask in the name of Jesus, that indeed the Middle East, Lord, will continue to be on the men because more and more will turn to Jesus and hope will, uh, of Jesus Christ will be in their heart. And lastly, Father God, we just ask for wisdom for believers in these areas. Uh, we're asking, as the word tells for us, tell us that to set the Lord Jesus Christ in our heart as Lord, it's a sanctify Jesus as Lord in our heart. We ask that for all believers in the Middle East, confronting with all kinds of uh, challenges, Lord, that they would have wisdom and understanding of how you would direct them to respond. And thank you again, Abba, Father, for this great work of Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.
It's my opportunity tonight, my turn, to bring the special music. And I want to sing to you what we have lovingly called the Christian's National Anthem. How Great Thou Art. <laughs> A song we love to sing here at First Baptist Church of Torrance. Think of the words as I sing them, how wonderful our God is and what he has done for us. My God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God His Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow with humble adoration and there proclaim, My God, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art.
we do serve a wonderful God. Amen? You know, we look out at the world today and we see, we see what's taking place and we see that man is, is searching frantically to find peace and make joy in their lives. But apart from knowing the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no hope. He is the only hope. And how thankful you and I are that we get to know him by way of his grace, and how thankful we are that he's left to us his word, his word which teaches us and draws us close to him. And it's his word that we preach here on Sunday mornings and Sunday night and in our life groups during the week here at the church campus and in homes. And uh, we are thankful that this is God's place, God's people sharing God's word. And praise the Lord for this precious opportunity that he's given to us. Dear family, would you kindly take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. And as you're turning, let me share with you some thoughts. Rejection. It's a word that you and I do not like to hear. But it's probably something that you and I have experienced. Now many people may not realize it. But if they look into God's word, they can see that God himself has been rejected. He's been rejected many times. He's being rejected today. I want to read for us a conversation that the prophet Samuel had with Almighty God regarding this rejection. I'm reading from 1 Samuel 8, from verses 4 through 7. Listen to what Samuel says. And the Lord says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like, what? All the nations. But the king, but the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being their king. What a terrible day this was for the people of Israel that they would take away their God, they would do away with their God, Almighty God, and in his place, they would put a mere man with all kinds of inherent weaknesses. But this they did. Rather than have God as their king, they wanted one like themselves. What a sad day this was. And as you read God's word, you realize that this resulted in a very bad decision for Israel. She faced plunder. She faced persecution. She lost the right to rule herself. But even more than that, she broke spiritual fellowship with Almighty God. God reached out to her, but at many times she turned a deaf ear his way. She continued to reject him. Well, as we look into John chapter 6, we see once again that the people of Israel are now rejecting God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given to them a life-saving message of forgiveness of sin. He's preached to them the entrance into the kingdom of God, and they are rejecting them. We wonder how this could take place. Jesus taught them the truth of the kingdom. He performed powerful miracles among them, miracles themselves which taught them spiritual truth. And then the love that he lavished on them, it was abundant. All of these things gave witness as to who he is. He is God the Son, the Messiah of Israel, and the Savior of the world. But they rejected him. Tonight we're considering the theme, the sorrow of rejecting Jesus. Would you please look with me, your copy of God's Word, John chapter 6. And I begin reading from verse 41. John 6 at verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, 
I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Notice, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they what? They died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we come to your word. Father God, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that it only speaks the truth. It is the truth. Truth, the very truth. And as we study it again tonight, I pray that you will make it real to our hearts, even though we've probably gone over this passage many times in our lifetime, those of us who have known you for years. O oh Lord, speak your truth to us tonight in a fresh way that we may leave this place with new thanksgiving for you and a new desire to serve you as never before. In this we ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The people to whom Jesus is speaking certainly fulfilled what the prophet Isaiah said of those who would be touched by Jesus' life and ministry and yet turn away from him. Isaiah proclaimed in Isaiah 53, verse 3, He, Jesus, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now we ask, why did these people to whom Jesus is ministering why did they reject him? Well, the first reason they rejected him was because they did not believe where he came from. They did not believe where he came from. They, they did not believe his heavenly origin. Verse 41 tells us, So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. The thought, the thought because they knew Jesus earthly parents, that there was really nothing special about this man, Jesus, that was ministering to them. It's interesting, as you look back into the Old Testament, the reaction of these people in the synagogue there in Capernaum was much as the Jews uh, treated the Lord and Moses in the wilderness. They murmured against God before and after the manna. They murmured wanting manna, and then when manna came, they murmured again. They continued to murmur against God's servants. But our Lord's answer to them in verse 4 of John 6 is very powerful. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. The Lord Jesus made no... Uh, he did not try to correct their ignorance here other than to rebuke their grumbling and to point them to the teaching of the ministry of God, his heavenly Father, who draws people to him, who draws people to his Son. May we clearly understand that no one comes to the Lord Jesus on their own. No one can do that. No one can believe on Jesus on their own. It takes the drawing ministry of the Father and the Holy Spirit, making the person and ministry of Jesus real to the heart. It's the Father who does this. As you and I look out on society today, so many people are ensnared in what we might call quicksand. 
the quicksand of sin and unbelief that unless God in his mercy draws them, they are hopelessly lost. This drawing now to God is not limited to a few. For later in John 12, verse 32, the Lord Jesus said, I will draw all people unto myself. Now in drawing all people unto himself, the Lord Jesus is not saying that everyone that is drawn will be saved. He's saying that it is the drawing ministry of the Father through the Son who brings people to him. And it's indiscriminate. The Lord Jesus calls not just the Jew to whom he came first, but he calls from every tribe, tongue, language, people, and nation. In John 10, 16, the Lord Jesus said, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, meaning the fold of Israel. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock and one shepherd. Aren't you thankful tonight that the Lord Jesus is not a respecter of persons? He loves us all. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us all. He reaches out to us all. And through the ministry of the Father and the Spirit, as he talks to us and convicts and dwells in our heart, we, we realize that we need him as our Savior. Otherwise, we have no other hope of having forgiveness of sins and peace with God. Dear family, as we look out on the world tonight, aren't you so thankful that the Lord Jesus and our Heavenly Father, in their divine wisdom, called you to belong to him? I sure am. How thankful we should be tonight and praise him every day that in his mercy, he called us to belong to him. Now, the Lord Jesus can share these spiritual truths with people because he alone has seen the Father. They could not understand that. They would not understand that. He alone had seen the Father. Notice our Lord's words in verse 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. And because Jesus alone has seen the Father, he alone can bring the message which the Father desires to be given so that unredeemed people might have a personal relationship with him. And this message is glorious. Once again, please look with me at verse 47 of John chapter 6. Notice what Jesus says here. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has what? Has eternal life. I am the bread of life, Jesus says. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread. I am the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Sadly, these people kept thinking of manna. Manna was God's provision for the nation of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. It was physical food. It did not have spiritual value. It was physical food. And after 40 years, it was no more. The people didn't live forever. They what? They died. But how different Jesus is. Whoever believes in him has eternal life. Jesus says he is the bread of life. He is the one that came down from heaven so that those who eat of this bread will not die. There's absolutely no comparison between the manna back in the Old Testament given to the nation of Israel and Jesus coming down from the Father and showing that he is the bread of life, the underline, the bread of life. There is no other people he's talking to. Listen, there is no other bread. I'm the one the Father sent. Expiration date, 40 years. But verse 51 of John 6 tells us that Jesus is the living bread. In other words, he brings continual spiritual nourishment. Many of us have received Christ 
as a child. And so we've lived a lot of years. And all through those years, the Lord Jesus, by his grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has brought to us continuous spiritual nourishment. He never leaves us alone. He never leaves his children alone. How thankful we are that we have a Savior who cares for his sheep. He alone is approved of the Father. That's as he came down from heaven. And to eat of this bread is to place one's faith in him. These people could not understand that. To eat of the bread that came down from heaven was to place faith in him as the Son of God and their Messiah, their Savior. But all of this, as God's word told us, will come at an enormous cost for Christ to bring us this, this constant spiritual nourishment. It cost him his life, paying the debt for the sin that you and I have done and the penalty which we should have taken, but we could have never paid it because sinners cannot pay for their sin. It is as he said in verse 51, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7 speaks powerfully to what the Lord Jesus just said here. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Jesus, then I said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. How thankful we are tonight that the Lord Jesus, as he looked out upon the world in eternity past, and he saw that what the Father was asking him to do, he did not recoil from going to the cross. He came knowing he was going. He willingly came to the cross for you and for me. Well, now, what will these people do with the spiritual truths that the Lord Jesus has been giving to them? Please look with me at verse 52 of John 6. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. In these verses, the Lord Jesus speaks quite clearly about how one may have eternal life. Did we notice that our Lord again and again and again invited these people to partake of him if they were to be recipients of eternal life? In verse 53, he says, eat the flesh, meaning of the Son of Man. Verse 54, feed on my flesh. Verse 56, feed on my flesh. Verse 57, feed on me. Verse 58, feeds on this bread. But again, people will say, what does this mean? They were asking, what does he mean? Feed on him, feed on his flesh. Eating the flesh of the living bread is a figure of speech which says to believe in him. Also, the Hebrew idiom, flesh and blood, refers to the total person so Jesus is insisting on complete commitment to him. Some people have said, I received Christ, but there was no change in their lives. 
They didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. They didn't want to have anything to do with his word. They said, yes, I accepted Christ. But did they really? Were they convicted of their sin? Did they repent of their sin? Did they want Jesus Christ to indeed be their savior? Dr. David Jeremiah says this of regarding the words of our Lord. If not for the Last Supper and Jesus' subsequent sacrifice on the cross, commemorated by the taking of the Lord's Supper, these words, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, would seem as strange to us as they did to the Jewish leaders. They are Jesus' instruction to rely on him as the source of life, fully committed to him. The Lord Jesus is not looking for lip service. He's looking for disciples. He's looking for people that will be committed to him, not for a moment, not for a little while, but for life. He's looking for people to commit to him. You look in the Gospels, and over and over again, he says, if you would follow me, take up your cross and follow me. It may be a life that you and I find difficult. It may be a life that you and I are rejected. Just as real nourishing food is needed to sustain physical life, so it is true for the spiritual. And verse 55 of John 6 makes it clear that there's only one source of real, nourishing, spiritual food. Here, Jesus said, For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. In these verses, the Lord Jesus emphasizes two glorious truths which we need to remember. We need to rejoice in them. First, to feed on his flesh and drink his blood we, we become possessors, possessors of eternal life. And Jesus will raise us up at the last day. This is the glorious promise. From the time we come to faith in Christ till the time he comes for us, or if we die before he comes, we are his forever. We never cease belonging to him. How wonderful that is to know he never lets go of his children. But then secondly, Jesus says in verse 56, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Simply stated, the one who abides in Christ makes their home in Christ. In other words, we don't come to Christ and then seek to move away from him. We come to Christ, we yield to him, it is our desire to live in him through the power of the Holy Spirit. As the Lord Jesus has given himself to us, abiding in us, never to leave, he says to us, abide in me. Live in me. Never move away from me. Abide in me as I abide in you. But now, after all of our Lord's reaching out to these dear people, patiently teaching them of the kingdom of God and offering himself to them as their Messiah, we come to what I mentioned earlier, the utter rejection of Jesus. How sad. Would you now please look with me at verse 60, John chapter 6. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is, is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. After this, many of his quote-unquote 
disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? Would you notice Simon Peter's response, please? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. But even though we sadly see the rejection of our Savior by the many who claim to be his disciples, we have the declaration of faith in Jesus by the Apostle Peter. Peter often gets a bad rap because of him denying the Lord three times. Peter realized that that, that, that was absolutely horrible. And as you look later on in the Gospel of John, Peter re repented of his sin, seriously, sincerely. He repented of what he had done, rejecting and saying he didn't know Jesus. Peter was a man who took his stand for Christ. After the Lord returned to heaven, Peter and Paul and John and others, they were the rocks that the Lord built his church upon. They, they stood the test. They were faithful. And here, we're going to see in a moment, once again, this declaration from Peter. Well, in verse 60 of John 6, as the people began to understand our Lord's teaching, they found it to be totally unacceptable. Unacceptable to whom? To themselves. But why? Because what he taught them, they realized that even though he did all these miracles even though he helped people to become well, even though he turned the bread and the fish to feed 5,000 men and their families, he was never going at that moment to deliver the nation of Israel from Rome. And they figured if he's not going to do that, then we do not need to give him the time of day, as we say. This was a crucial turning point in the gospel. Besides the hostile Jewish leaders who were there that day in in uh, Capernaum, the Galilean disciples turned away from the Lord Jesus. And in reality, those who turned away from him really could not be called disciples. A brief, a brief description of a disciple is a learner. A learner who not only hears what's in their mind, but a learner who obeys what they've heard. They were mere followers but they were not what we would call a biblical disciple. Those who left Jesus that day were not true disciples of him. Dr. Warren Wearsby says regarding a situation such as this, the preaching of the word of God always leads to a sifting of the hearts of the listeners. God draws sinners to the Savior through the power of truth, his word. Those who reject the word will reject the Savior. And those who receive the word will receive the Savior and experience the new birth and eternal life. Well, over against these false disciples who deserted Jesus were those who remained true to him. I direct your attention once again to verse 67. I marvel... I marvel at this. It was back in the 1970s that 67 through 69 grabbed a hold of my heart as I was in study. The declaration of Peter, how powerful it was. The people have walked away. Verse 67, so Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Notice, please. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And notice, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. 
That's a disciple. He heard. He believed. He knew what Jesus was saying was true. And he fully committed his life to him, warts and all, just like we all have in our walk with Christ. We come to Christ, and yet there are times we still fail him. But in his mercy, he does not get rid of us. Aren't you thankful? I'm so thankful that he stays true to us, even though we have times of failure before him. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Cleanse us of our sins. Cleanse us of all our unrighteousness. Peter knew as he listened to Jesus that he was the one for whom the nation was waiting. He was the one for whom Peter was waiting. There was no other. Lord, you're the one. I don't care if those people leave. They don't have an influence on me. I belong to you. Wow. What a statement. Lord, to whom shall we go? Child of God, may I share with you that there is absolutely nobody else to whom we can go. In our hour of need, there's nobody else to whom we can go. In a time of temptation, there's nobody else to whom we can go. In a time when you and I are discouraged and we feel so low and we wonder who can help, to whom shall we go? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Only God the Father through the Holy Spirit could have made these truths real to Peter and the other disciples. And the same is true for us today who have placed our faith in Christ as the Son of God and our Savior from sin. But then we have this sad note regarding Judas. Look at verse 70, please, John 6. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. Jesus called Judas a devil. But the disciples, though discouraged at that moment, looking back on this moment, would reflect on the prophecy of their Lord that what he said was true, and it was true, and they would be strengthened knowing that even then what the Lord said of Judas was true, they could count on what he said. Judas was a tragic figure influenced by Satan, and he was responsible for his own evil choices. He couldn't blame anybody else. But in spite of the negative tone in verse 70, as we look over John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus Christ showed himself as the true Messiah of Israel, through his teaching, through his miracles, through his interaction with the people. And Peter and the other ten disciples, in essence, like Peter said, surrendered their hearts and lives to the Lord. And the Lord then began to once again work in the lives of these men to prepare them for ministry, for when he would rise again from the grave and ascend to his Father in heaven. You see, a true disciple belonging to Jesus, like these 11, showed themselves to be real learners. They believed the Lord Jesus, and they knew that he was the Holy One of God. As I think of that, may you and I follow in their footsteps this week, knowing that we are following the only one who takes us to the Father, who cleanses us of our sins, who makes peace in our lives, who makes sense in our lives when everything else seems to go wrong. He is there for us. How thankful we are that this Lord Jesus, as we see in John chapter 6, never, never changes. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
We thank you for your word and we thank you for the Lord Jesus. And I just pray now, Heavenly Father, that if there is anyone here in the worship center, anyone here online who has never believed in the Lord Jesus as their Savior, trusting him for the forgiveness of their sins, I pray, Heavenly Father, that they would invite you to come into their life. They would believe upon you and turn their lives over to you and allow you to do in them what nobody else can ever do for them. Make them right with your Father. Give them your peace. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. And we give you praise in his name. Amen. Please stand and I will sing our closing hymn, 581. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. 581. I'll sing verses 1 and 2. in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I put him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just with simple faith to plunge Neath the healing, cleansing blood, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I put him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. As we close tonight, I just want to remind you of Peter's first words to the Lord Jesus. Lord, to whom shall we go? May we take those words with us as we go into our new week, knowing that the Lord Jesus is the only one to whom we can go, and knowing that he, as he ministered to us, to bring us to himself, also ministers to us to keep us to himself. Amen? Amen? Amen. God bless you, dear family. God bless you, dear family online. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you, Neville.